Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. My name is Esther, and I'm so glad to be with you. I see we have a full house, lots and lots of viewers in the crowd. Welcome. If you haven't yet, please let us know where you're joining us from today. We'd love to hear where you are, which part of the world you're in, where you're tuning in from. So let us know, please. Uh, shout out to all of our viewers. So great to see you all here with us. We're so glad we have such an amazing topic, amazing speaker. It's going to be a fabulous session today. Uh, today we'll be talking about advanced DNA features on my heritage, uh, which I know is always a very, very popular subject, but especially now because of a promotion that we have going on at my heritage, something that I think you should all know about right now uh, from February 21st until February 28th. You can upload DNA kits uh, if you've tested at a different service, whether it be 23andMe, Ancestry. Uh, you can take those DNA kits and upload them to MyHeritage. And normally there's an unlock fee in order to unlock advanced DNA features. But right now at MyHeritage, uh, we are waiving that fee. So it's a limited time offer just until the 28th. You can upload DNA kits that you've tested with other services and get all of the advanced features on my heritage for my heritage DNA kits uh, for free. Uh, so it's really an incredible offer. And this includes the MyHeritage chromosome browser, auto clusters, theory of family relativity, um, our new genetic groups. That's part of your ethnicity estimate that you get on MyHeritage. So you'll get these absolutely free. And these features will remain free forever for the DNA kits that you upload to MyHeritage during this week. So we'll be putting a link to this promotion in the comment section um, and if you've already tested with another service we all know there's this concept of fishing in in multiple ponds and just uh putting putting your test out there so that you can get matches from all the different services so we highly recommend that um, so there's really no better time for us to be talking about advanced dna features than a week where uh, anyone can get them for free so a great session. Uh, before we jump into it, I just want to let you know also that we will be having a giveaway for today. So today's giveaway will be giving away at MyHeritage DNA kit. We're talking about MyHeritage DNA, so <laughs> it's only fitting that we will give one lucky winner a MyHeritage DNA kit. And in order to win, uh, please comment in the comments section throughout today's session about what you have discovered using MyHeritage DNA, whether you have taken a MyHeritage DNA kit or maybe you've uploaded for, from a kit from a different service as I just spoke about. Uh, just leave us a comment and tell us something that you've discovered using uh, our DNA services. Let us know in the comment section or which is your favorite DNA feature on MyHeritage. Let us know what it is, uh, why you enjoy using it. We want to hear. So one lucky winner, we will uh, will be chosen at the end of today's session after the questions and we'll receive a MyHeritage DNA kit. So a fabulous prize. And of course, if you've already taken a MyHeritage DNA kit yourself, you know that um, there's always there are always other people in our families that we want to test, that we want to give a kit to. So, uh, you know, you can give it to a, a, a family member that hasn't tested before or even a friend as a gift. So a uh, great opportunity there. Um, today we have with us the Director of Product and MyHeritage at Ron Sneer. Ron Sneer is a fabulous speaker. Uh, he has come on our Facebook Lives before, and it is always a pleasure to have him. So let me bring him on here. Hi, Ron. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. As I said, it's not your first time, but we love having you on our My Heritage Facebook Lives. Yeah, absolutely. I love being here. And I see the comments going on in the chat, and it's amazing. <laughs> everybody here 
Yeah, so I know that Ron is a bit of a fast speaker. So before before he even starts, I'm going to tell everyone uh, that if you miss any part of today's session, uh, if you want to rewatch any of it at any point uh, after the session is over, it will be saved on the My Heritage Facebook page under the video section. So don't don't worry if you miss any of it or you want to rewatch it. Uh, it will be there, and you can rewatch it. Uh, at any point in time, so I just wanted to just wanted to start with that, Ron. <laughs> well, I will I will speak slowly. I promise. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Right. Um, so, do you want to share your screen with us? Yes, sure. With me. There we go. All right. Let me know when it's coming through. Okay. Let me know just when we're good to go. Great. There, we see it now. All right. OK, so I don't see the chat anymore, so I don't see your questions and the thing you raised. Uh, but there'll be plenty of time towards the end um, to answer any of the questions or any of the feedback that uh, you might have. So great to be here. Uh, it's been a while since I did my last Facebook Live. Um, and today we're going to discuss the advanced DNA features. And as Esther said, uh, what better time of the year to do that than a week in which uh, when you upload your DNA data, if you've tested with another uh, company, you're going to get all these advanced DNA features included. Um, so I highly recommend that. And a word about myself. My name is Rand Sneer. I'm a director of product management, and I'm responsible for my heritage DNA. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the past four years or so. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to share some information and... Uh, go over the different things you get uh, when you test with uh, MyHeritage, when uh, uh, you test with MyHeritage DNA or upload your data from another service. So we're going to do a product overview today. I'm going to show the different things, uh, focusing mostly on the uh, tools that let you um, um, do your genealogical research, your genetic genealogical research. Um, and it's going to start from the very basic, and we're going to move forward from there. Um, all right. So if you've taken a DNA test, the time comes, uh, and your results are ready. You're through that uh, difficult time of waiting for the results to come in. And when your results are in, uh, there are two sections we're going to focus about today. So the first one is the overview section uh, that's located under DNA on myheritage.com. All the screen captures I'm going to show today are from my own personal results. Um, so these are mine, and this is how the page looks like. And it starts with a glimpse to your ethnicity estimate. We're not going to discuss that today. Uh, we had a Facebook Live not long ago by, uh, given by one of my colleagues, Shachal Tenenbaum. Uh, so I highly recommend you watch it if you haven't. Uh, but he's talking there a lot about the ethnicity estimate and our recent edition, the genetic groups, uh, which we pushed out towards end of December. And the overview page is here to give you some tools to look at your DNA matches in a different angle. So the first way how we're breaking down your DNA matches is by how close, close they are to you, by the relationship proximity. So you can see here three circles, and we can see the close family. These go up to a first cousin. And I have nine of these. I've tested a lot of my family members, including my father, my daughter, my mom, uh, and brother, and uh, grandma, which you can see there. The extended family, which goes all the way to third cousins, and then anyone, every anyone who's um, who's more distant than that will be in the distant relatives category. So you can see that when I took this uh, screen capture, I had about eight thousand six hundred DNA matches. Uh, today I'm way past that. Uh, that's an old screen capture. Uh, we already have in the MyHeritage database four point seven million people, and every day we have more people joining this journey. Um, so the, D the DNA matches are added on on daily basis. So these numbers will adjust if you log in today, tomorrow, or the day after. Uh, so that's a great way. And each one of these sections is clickable so that you can click on this section and go to your DNA matches list, and it'll be filtered to show you only these matches. So that's the relationship. That's one way to look at your DNA matches. Another one which I find really cool is by the location. And this is the location where your DNA matches live today, where they reside. Um, so you can see a nice map and the table on the right. And everything here is clickable. So again, if I'm looking now at my DNA matches from Israel, for example, which I have 173 out of these, I can click on Israel 
and will be uh, I'll be taken to the DNA matches page to look at those DNA matches. Last section on this page is we're taking your DNA matches, we're looking at their ethnicity results, and then we're grouping them by that. So for example, when I received my results, I knew all my life that I'm 100% Ashkenazi Jewish. And when I took the test, I discovered that I'm actually 96% Ashkenazi Jewish. And I have additional 4% of Iberian, um, which kind of struck me by surprise. When I tested my mom, I saw that she's 8%, which makes sense. And I kind of started researching that um, branch of the family or what I didn't know of. And this is a great way. So if I want to look at my DNA matches who are also sharing the Iberian ethnicity, I can click on that second line and I'll see just the list of these 383 DNA matches who also have Iberian in their results and focus on that side of the research. So that was the overview page and it's kind of like a welcome screen or kind of summarizes as the name suggests. Uh, what what you see there on the DNA matches page that's where all the goodies really uh, exist so in the DNA matches here when I click on that I see my list by default it's sorted by those who are closer to me so I can see my dad my mom and brother grandma and a cousin over there and then it goes uh, through pages and pages of more DNA matches who are more distant um, in relation so this is each one of these is a DNA match card, what we call a card. And in the card, we give you different information about this DNA match. So let's take one of my DNA matches, uh, one I like the most. Uh, so I look at him, I see that I, had, I have a new DNA match on my heritage, and that's a Homer Simpson. And at the top left side, I can see the, the age group. He's in his 40s. He's from the US. And I can contact him uh, right from here. If I want to ask a question, I found something that's interesting for me. I can reach out to Homer and learn more. The estimated relationship, which you see right there, is what we believe, based on the genetic information that we have, the DNA match that was formed between you and Homer in this case, we can tell you what is the range, what is the possible relation between the two of you uh, based on the genetics that you can see to the right over there. So Homer in this case, is he can be my first cousin twice removed to a third cousin. Now, many times people um, get lost with the terms. And for that, we had this question mark that you see right here. And if you'll click on that, you will see a dynamic chart that opens up, which lets you understand in relation to you where Homer can fit. So we can see here the first cousin twice removed. I hope you can see my cursor. So that's here. And all the way to a third cousin. And Homer can fit into each one of these categories. So that gives me like a good overview or like a good uh, start to understand how Homer is related to me. So use that. At the bottom, we can see genealogical information that we have on Homer. So on my heritage, as you probably know, uh, people are building their family trees and adding information about themselves and their ancestors. So here I can see that Homer appears in a family tree which has about 900 people, and it's managed by a Marge Simpson who is also from the US. And then we're giving some information what's common between you and Homer based on the tree information that we have, that you have on my heritage and that he has. And we'll deep dive into that in a second. At the top right corner, you have the option to add a note. So you can click on that and add yourself notes. No one can see that by you, but you. And you can edit and save the notes and clear the notes as you go by and as you learn more things about, for example, Homer, if I discover that he's related to me on my maternal side, I can put a little comment here and it'll be available for me later on. What else can you do on the DNA matches page? So the first thing to work with your list is to filter them. And things will start to come back uh, regarding the overview page I discussed just a moment ago. So when you click on filters, you have a couple of options to filter your DNA matches list. So on the tree, all three details, uh, you have the option to filter only the DNA matches with whom you have a theory of family relativity. We'll discuss that very soon. With whom you have smart matches, with whom you have a shared surname or a shared place. And that will filter the list and will leave only the ones which uh, meet that criteria that you selected. The next three options, are the ones we saw in the overview. So the relationships categories, the close, the extended, and the distant, 
where in the world they're from, where they live today, and which ethnicities they have in their results. You can sort the list differently. As I mentioned, by default, it's sorted so that you see your closest matches first. But sometimes you'd like to see the amount of shared segments that you have, or the largest segment that you have with a person, sort them alphabetically by name, or use the most recent option, and then you will see the matches which were added recently on top. You can also search the list, and you can type here either a name or an ancestral surname. So when I'm looking, for example, and I'm trying to research my Bloom uh, family branch, I can type here Bloom, and all of the DNA matches which has Bloom as an ancestral surname in their trees will appear in the list. All right, so that was the, the overall list of the DNA matches. And now we are ready to deep dive and actually look at the information and all of the hints we've given you so far. So for each DNA match, there's the option to go to the review DNA match page. And there's an option also to look at the tree if the person has a tree on my heritage. So if I'm going and looking at the review DNA match, match page, and here I'm going to look at the um, page for my cousin Tomer in most of the examples I'm going to show now, you can see that this page, I had to break it into three different screen captures because it's very long, because there are a lot of goodies in here that can help you eventually figure out how you and a person are related to one another. So let's start with the first one. If we were able to find the theory of family relativity, which I'll explain in a second what it is for those who don't know, we'll show it to you here. Theory of family relativity is what we call uh, internally at MyHeritage the Holy Grail. So what we're doing here is that we're taking all of the DNA, all of the pieces of information we have on my heritage, and trying to tell you exactly, not as a common surname or a common ancestral place, but to tell you exactly how you and a DNA match are related and who are your common ancestors, like in the example here. And the way we did it, we're taking, the way we do it, is that we're taking all of the data that we have on my heritage and we're trying to bind it together. We're trying to connect all of the dots. So these are the numbers we currently have on my heritage. So we have about 13 billion historical records with people, you know, census records, newspapers, um, and, and other uh, sources of, of data. And in those, you can see links between people. This uh, man married this woman, woman and they had these, uh, these are their children by names and dates. And we can connect the dots and kind of build like small families and link between them. Same with the family trees, as you probably know. So we have millions of those, and they're all we are able to detect same the, the same individuals in different trees and try to like create a huge tree that's connecting everyone out of those 4.3 billion profiles in the in the family trees that we have today. So a nice image that I like to use when I'm talking about the theory of family relativity is this one. So think of each one of these dots kind of like a, a source, a family tree, a record, a collection, and it connects between, and you can connect between those. And that's what we're doing with the theory of family relativity. We're calling it the big tree. And there we're trying to link everyone, anyone we can to the rest and kind of build a huge family tree out of which we can hopefully build a path that explains how you and person A are related to one another. And this, that's what the theory suggests. So let's take this example. Um, I'm using here Roman, for example, on the top, on the bottom left. He's the person I'm looking at his results right now. And he has a matched Emilia. And we can see that we were able to find a path that connects the two of them. And if you'll go to the viewful theory, and this theory right here suggests that there are second cousins once removed on the mother's side of Roman. So if you click on the viewful theory, you'll be able to see the exact path and the different sources right here at the top, which we used to form this, this uh, theory that explains how Roman and Emilia are related to one another. So let's see how we did that. So you can see right there at the top that we started with Roman's own tree that he has on my heritage. And from there, we went to his mom and his grandfather. And then we hopped we jumped to a different source. Roman filled only that information, for example. But we were able to find his grandfather, Keep Solomon, in a different tree on my heritage, uh, the Collision website, Ballora Collision from Australia. And the dates looked fine, 
and the name <clears throat> looks like it's matching. And we believe that this is the same individual, but Laura added much more information that helped us go up in the tree, up in the theory, and find who uh, the, the common ancestors might be. So you can see here an indication for 100% with this green icon. And that means that we were able to find a smart match. A smart match for those who don't know are exactly what, what's going on here. It's a person, individual, who exists in one tree and exists in another tree. And we think that these are the same people. So if you'll click on that icon, you'll be able to see a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison showing you the information from source A and source B. And you can decide for yourself whether the information makes sense. So there are some some uh, uh, things that uh, are, very, are identical, such as the death place that I see here and the birth place, but there are some differences. I added more siblings and uh, Laura added uh, a more accurate uh, birth date, for example, and you can decide whether you think that's the same person. So we continued the tree up until we got to this couple right here, Alexander and Margaret. That's all from Laura's tree. She's not related to this DNA match at all. We have Roman and Emilia, but we had to to use the help of Laura to find the path. And then we're starting to go down and we're jumping to another tree on my heritage uh, managed by Jacqueline from Great Britain and eventually ending up at the tree that Amelia is managing. Um, and that's how the theory comes to life. And that's how we're able to say that there are second cousins once removed. Now I will mention that we chose the name theory of family relativity for a reason. Uh, one is to credit Einstein, but the second one, uh, it's because these are theories, as it might come as a shock, but a lot of people put information in their family trees that are, is incorrect. I know, amazing. But we need to take that into consideration, and we don't want to say that for sure or we were able to find, but rather that we're suggesting a theory of how you and Amelia are related, and we're giving you all the tools to judge for yourself and decide whether it makes sense or not. Now, if, you, if we were able to find a theory for you, that's great. That's We saved you most of the genealogical work, and you can judge for yourself and maybe understand the exact relationship and who were the common ancestors. But in many of the cases, uh, we don't. Um, and then we need to use the other tools that we have on this page. So smart matches, as I explained, this is me and Tomer, my cousin that I'm looking at. And I'm looking at smart matches, people who exist on my family tree and exist on his. So we can see these people, and if you have a smart match, means that you have a person in your tree that we believe also exists uh, in your DNA matches tree, that's a really good hint uh, how you might be related. So these will come first if you don't have a theory of family relativity. Next in line, we have the shared ancestral surnames. So again, a surname is something that's very helpful if you're trying to understand how you and another person uh, are related. And here I can see that Tomer has in his, um, uh, in, his, in his tree Bloom and Carmen. And I know that these, these, these surnames are from my maternal side. And that can help me in case I didn't know who Tomer was. I can understand which side of the family he might be related to me. So the names really are really helpful. In case there are no common surnames, uh, we will still show you the surnames from your tree and from his tree so that you can decide for yourself. We do have algorithms that take uh, spelling, different spellings uh, into account. So some people write Cohen with a C and Cohen with a K. We would still mention that and tell you that we believe we found a shared surname, but we will indicate the differences and the different spelling. Uh, in some of the languages, we are also able to use uh, translations. So if I wrote that, for example, in Hebrew and he wrote it in English, we'll be able to detect that. But in some of the cases, we don't. And here you can look for yourself and see whether the names Haidt and Golnitsky rings a bell. And maybe you still haven't added those to your family tree, but you know them. So we would still list them. Next, we have the ancestral places. So the ancestral places are the places where your ancestors and your DNA matches ancestors came from. So when I'm looking at Tomer, I can see here at the top left that we have several countries from where our ancestor, we both have ancestors coming from and these are indeed correct. So in this case, I'm looking at the Bulgaria country, and I can see here at the table at the bottom, the ancestors from my tree and the ancestors from Tomer tree, Tomer's tree. And I can see here my grandma and my great-grandpa uh, on my maternal side, 
because that's how we're related. And you can uh, zoom in on the map and look at specific countries. In some of the cases, we'll be able to tell you a specific city if both you and your DNA matches have entered that when you built your family tree. Uh, and that, these are really great indications telling you that you have ancestral uh, events uh, from the same place around the world. So for a place to be considered a shared ancestral place, we're taking countries and states in the case of the US. Here's another example when I'm looking at Russia. So we can see here that while uh, we do have uh, shared ancestral events in Russia, I can see that here I have Chelyabinsk in Russia where Paul Milman, my great grandfather came from. And Tomer doesn't have anyone in Chelyabinsk, Russia, but he did log Russia. So we will separate that so that you can look both at the city level and in the country level. But all of the events will be uh, mentioned here so that you can look for yourself and see whether it makes sense or not. We are using different color when there's an exact match and a purple color to indicate when there is an event only on his side. A gray, sorry, not purple. Next in line is the tool that I think is the most useful when working with your DNA matches list and trying to understand how a DNA match is related to you. And that is the shared DNA matches. Shared DNA matches are people who you match and also the person you're currently look at, your DNA match, is also matching them. So let's assume for a second that I didn't know who Tomer was. And I'm looking at the list that's shown to me here. I can see my mom and I can see her sister my daughter, which doesn't add a lot of value for the sake of uh, this purpose, and my brother, but I don't see my father here who I tested. And that can give me a good hint that Tomer is related to me on my maternal side. If I've tested my grandma or my grandpa, I can check also if they appear here and then also maybe make another, um, another decision or understand something more and say whether he's related to me on the paternal, uh, on, on my grandpa side, on grandma side. So this list is very useful. I want to show something that we uh, released just about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks. Uh, a lot of you have asked for that, and we think it's a really good recommendation. So thanks for all of you who have raised that. Uh, when you're looking at the shared DNA matches, sometimes you're not sure whether um, it's worth going to the review match page and looking at the tree, and maybe you have already left a note on that person. So in those cases, we will add those two indications that you see on the screen now, and that's already live on the website. So if the person exists in the family tree, we'll show you this uh, tree icon at the top. And when you hover over that, we will tell you how many people are there. And you can click to look at the tree of Barry, uh, in this case, the shared DNA matches. If I already added a note on the match, like in the Sam case, in the, in the case of Sam right here, there will be an icon here. And you can see the note and edit it right from the shared DNA matches section. So that's brand new. One more thing we do show here is the icon on the right, which you can see here. And that icon represents that triangulation of segments exist between the three of you. Remember, I'm now looking at myself, Tomer in this case, who's the DNA match I'm currently reviewing, and his mom here. We'll talk about triangulation in a couple more slides. So bear with me. Below the shared DNA matches, we have the pedigree chart which lets you, gives you a quick uh, overview of the pedigree chart of Tomer. Uh, and you can look at the people here, the names, and see if something rings a bell. That saves you the time of jumping to look at his family tree. We have another component showing you the shared ethnicities between you and the other person. So aside of the shared DNA matches, which we spoke about, all the other components or parts of this page take into consideration and surface genealogical information people have put in their trees. Shared DNA matches and the shared ethnicities we're looking at now, um, they are the, uh, the different ones. Um, and the reason is that here we take only genetics into account. Let's say that Tomer didn't build a tree on my heritage, or Elon in this case, that's his brother. And I want to know how we're related. So if, for example, one of my parents, I was 50% Ashkenazi Jewish and 50% Iberian, and I can see that Elon has also Ashkenazi Jewish, that also can direct me and tell me which side of the family we're related from. And last but not least is the chromosome browser at the bottom of the page. And the chromosome browser shows you 
Um, there's a different Facebook Live I did a while ago that talks about the bits and bytes of genetics and how we are really detecting DNA matches and what's going on behind the scenes. We won't have too much time for that today, but each one of us, we have 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes, and that's what we're looking at when we're looking uh, searching for DNA matches. We're looking for um, um, matching segments or um, identical or similar genetic pieces on your genome uh, between you and other people. And the graph that you see here, the chromosome browser, where, where you see the purple parts, is the one indicating where on the chromosome you share DNA with that person. So I can see here that with Elon, I share 34 DNA segments, and they are located here on the chromosome. Now, usually when looking at the one-on-one, -on -one, when I'm looking at myself and Elon, it doesn't add too much value, to be honest, but the information that exists here can be very useful when you're trying to understand how you're related to your DNA matches. And I'll explain now. That's, uh, in a nutshell, how your DNA data looks like when the lab is done analyzing it and uh, we get your uh, DNA file. So you can see that each one of us, as I said, we have 22 autosomal chromosomes. So this, for example, can be chromosome number five. And we, these are pairs because we inherit one allele, what we call, or one line here from our uh, father and then the other line from our mother. And we're trying to look for sequences, repetition, something that looks similar, that's big enough, so that we can indicate and say that we believe that this is a segment inherited from a common ancestor. Maybe, far, maybe close, maybe far, but that's what we're doing. And these, when we find these identical pieces, this is what you see on the chromosome browser. These are those sections that identify you and the other person as DNA matches. And now we can talk about triangulation once we understood the basics. So on my heritage, we say the triangulated segments are shared DNA segments that you, I'll skip the brackets part, and all of the selected DNA matches that you're looking at at the moment share with each other, and therefore likely all inherited from a common ancestor. And we're going to look at some examples. And in order to do that, let's use this example right here. So this is a family tree. And we have four people at the bottom who have taken a DNA test. Some of them are related through um, uh, common ancestors that are shared between others, and some are not. So if we were trying to say, I want to look at three people who have common ancestors. All the three of them have a pair of common ancestors. And I hope that you can see that, but we have two groups of these. So the first group is Carol, Alice, and Bob. And for the three of them, when we're trying to look for the common ancestors, we're, go, we're going up, up to William and Zendra. So William and Zendra have contributed some of their DNA. They passed it down all the way to Carol, Alice, and Bob. So we can expect to see share, uh, DNA matches between the three of them, and those pieces of DNA matches were inherited from this couple. But there's another group here, and these are Alice, Bob, and David. And here the common ancestors are different. Now we can see that Eve and Zelda have also contributed or passed down some of their DNA to the three of these, to Alice, Bob, and David. So they will also very likely triangulate because they, they should all match one another and they should all match on the same spots inherited from this couple. Let's look at that example. And for that, we're moving to our next advanced DNA tool, which is the chromosome browser that can be found under the tool section in DNA. When you'll go to the chromosome browser, you'll start with your list of DNA matches. So this is me, and these are my top DNA matches. I have the option to search. And I want to look at something. I chose three DNA matches who I think are all related to me, and I suspect that they're all uh, we are all uh, related through the same common ancestors. And I'm adding them by clicking on the cards at the, at the bottom. And then they're added up. I can compare myself to up to seven different DNA matches and see if we all triangulate and how the DNA data looks like. So when I'm looking at this, I can see that we don't have any triangulated segments. There are no overlaps. Each line here represents, I scroll to the bottom here, but I mean, when I'm looking at chromosome number 22, for example, 
I can see that there's no spot in which the three of us are all triangulating. There's no segments of DNA which I share with the three of them that they're all sharing with one another, and therefore there is no indication for triangulation. Seems like, or at least based on the data that we have, there's no common ancestors that we can expect here. Here's an example where it does happen. So I'm looking, I'm back to the selection screen and I'm cho choosing my father and his mother, my grandma, and I'm hitting compare. And this is the top of the screen. And I can see here that me and all of the selected DNA matches share 25 triangulated segments. There's a card with the color that represents the shared DNA with that person. You can see up to uh, seven lines because I'm comparing myself to up to seven people, in this case, two. So the red bars are the areas on chromosome one, which I have shared DNA with my father. And the orange ones are the ones where I share with my grandma. So you can see that I share less DNA with my grandma than with my dad. That's also indicated here, roughly 50% with my dad and then 25% with my grandma because additional 25 were inherited from my grandpa. And when you see those bubble right here, that's an indication that there's a triangulation happening. It means that I'm matching with my dad, I'm matching with my grandma, that we know by the colors, but the bubble also indicates that my dad and my grandma all are also matching here, and therefore there's a triangulation. This is probably a common ancestor. In this case, that's my grandma. If you hover over each one of the sections, you can see the information about the triangulated segments, the chromosome it is, the position, and what is the size, and additional information um, that maybe we'll do a separate Facebook Live at some point for. At the bottom of the list, there's a, a table which can also give you the information if you want to store it uh, separately or copy it to a note on that DNA match. Because if a new DNA match comes in and he's triangulating with a, um, a blood relative, you know the connection to him, which you know the con how the two of you are related, having a new DNA match comes in with, and you, the three of you are triangulating, that might be a good indication who the common ancestor is. All right. Now, I mentioned the bubbles, but I want to repeat that for a second. So you can see here that even though I'm looking at myself and my grandma and myself and Jackie, there are no triangulated segments, even though you can see overlap on some sections of the genome. What that problem tells us, the reason that this is happening, is either that Jackie and uh, my grandma are not matching at all, or they're matching, but not in these areas. And for that, we're going to use that, um, that graph that I created before. And here is an example to what, um, pro what is probably happening on chromosome 1, where you see the overlap. So because I inherited this from my mom and this from my dad, so this is the sequence that is repeating with my grandma, and this is the sequence which is repeating with Jackie, but Jackie and my grandma are not sharing any DNA in this area. So the bubble is the indication that the three of us are matching each other and in that exact position. All right, we'll skip this. One more tool I want to talk about before we open this up for questions is the autoclusters. Uh, which can also be found under uh, the tool section. Autoclusters is a feature that we released about two years ago, I think. Uh, it's February, so exactly two years ago. Uh, we worked on that uh, together with EJ Blum, who is the one-man show behind Genetic Affairs, uh, a concept that he started uh, about four months before we actually went live with this, I think. And the autoclusters is a tool that lets you group your DNA matches together in a very cool way. And I'll explain what it's doing. So if you'll go there, you'll have the option to generate your autocluster report. And you'll see an example of what you should expect to get. And after you generate it, an email will be sent. And in the email, you'll see something like this. And let's go one by one and explain what it's doing. When you open the autocluster report, it will look like this. But within a second, things will start flying around with a nice uh, animation effect. And the colors will align in a way, showing you the autoclusters that you have. So we showed all that, and I explained uh, what you're going to get, but I didn't say what autoclusters are. So autoclusters are groups of people who are matching one another and forming a group by that. 
and we can separate them from other groups of your DNA matches who are matching one another but are not matching the first group. And we can break your DNA matches into groups by looking at your DNA matches and the shared DNA matches. I'll explain. Here, this is my DNA matches list, okay? And for each one of the people here, we saw that there's a shared DNA matches component, which shows me who I'm matching with and the other person is matching with. And what we're doing here is that we're looking at those groups and we're trying to build, um, uh, we're looking at the shared DNA matches and we're trying to build groups of people who are matching one another. So if, for example, I'm looking at my DNA matches, I can see, for example, that my DNA matches A, B, C, and D are all matching me and matching one another. And there are additional DNA matches who are matching one another, but not matching the A, B, C, and D. So these are probably two different groups. They are, I'm probably related to them through other common ancestors. And I can break those down into two. And in that case, maybe A, B, C, and D are related to me through dad and E, F, and G through mom. And that's exactly what AutoClusters is doing. So it's breaking them down and showing you groups of people who are probably related from ancestor A. We won't be able to tell you who is the ancestor, but there's a lot of information that you can use to learn that. And the orange ones are separated from the blue ones, and they're from ancestor B. So what you see here on the left and top uh, are the people, these are your DNA matches. So we can look at Kaya and we can see that she's matching Macy and Crystal and Ethel and other people. And they form this group of people who are matching one another to a sufficient degree that our algorithms decided to form a group for them, to form a cluster. And they're together. And, and so sorry, and so on and so forth. And each one of these is pretty much, it's, it's pointing to a different branch of the family. These are people related through a different ancestor or a couple of ancestors. And that's what AutoClusters allows us to do. Let's zoom in for a second and I'll explain what we saw before. So here I can see, for example, that I have a DNA match called Wilson Brook and another match called Greg Hicks. And every time that you see a dotted cell, a colored cell, I'm sorry, that means that there is, there's shared DNA match between the three of you because all of these are your DNA matches. And we can see that Greg and Wilson are matching one another as well. Sometimes you will see the areas where there's no, no uh, color area. That's because there's no shared DNA match, but the person in the cluster is matching enough people from this cluster. So we decided to keep him in. It, it uh, crossed our thresholds. And there's a separate session. Auto clusters is, is, is a fascinating tool that opens uh, tons of options and different ways to look at your DNA matches and organize them. Uh, but it's a very, uh, there's a lot to learn about that. And uh, maybe we'll cover that in a separate uh, talk in the future. You can hover at any given time and see the names of the people who also exist in the cluster. So to leave some room for questions, uh, I will end with that. Uh, there's so much more to talk about. This is always a challenge when I'm doing those Facebook Lives to decide what I'm going to talk about and still leave room for um, enough qu time for questions. So I just wanted to say again that this week, if you upload your DNA data, all of the things I showed you now will be available for you with no additional cost. Uh, so you can go now to myheritage.com slash DNA slash upload and upload your DNA files if you've tested with another vendor. And all of that, once it takes us a couple of days to calculate the results, and once those are in, you'll be able uh, to view all of the things we saw now, in addition to the genetic groups and ethnicity estimate, uh, which we, the genetic groups were recently added. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Ron. Um, I see that it was, a huge success, a lot of comments here uh, about viewers who are going to uh, be watching this over <laughs> and over a few more times. I see Barb said, wow, I need to check out that Ancestral Places. That is awesome. Uh, Liz said, I can already see how I've been missing some great results by not using filters. They may help me get some more successes. So I think a, a lot of uh, a lot of new things were learned here in this session, which is which is fantastic. Uh, I think we can get straight into the comments because 
uh, to the questions because I think there there are a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> just a reminder, a reminder for anyone who missed it or who came in in the middle, you can rewatch this session afterwards. It'll be available on the My Heritage Facebook page under the videos section. So uh, don't worry if you missed any bit and you want to go at your own pace and watch it again. Um, so feel free to check it out later. Um, so we'll just jump right into the questions. Let's see. Um, let's see what we have here. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Anne asks, um, for uploading a DNA file, do I have to do that on a computer or can I use my iPad to upload from 23andMe? So I think that specifically iOS does not allow that because you won't be able to store that file locally on your device. Uh, with Android, I know it's possible. Uh, you're doing that with the mobile web. Uh, it's more recommended doing that on, um, on a computer. Both Mac and Windows are fine, and Linux, those who use that. Um, uh, when you go to myheritage.com slash DNA slash upload, uh, there's a wizard uh, right there on the right that explains how to download your data from the other testing companies. It will guide you step by step how to do that. Uh, for each one of the companies, we do support all the big ones, which are Ancestry, 23andMe, and Family Tree DNA. And I didn't mention, I think I didn't mention that, uh, that we do support managing DNA files for more than just yourself, so other family members. If you've tested them, uh, when you upload your, your DNA data, we will ask you whether uh it belongs to you or someone else and we will ask you to indicate the name so you can look at your results and other people's results as well if you've tested more family members and it's a quick process right uh, uploading a dna test from another service a couple of minutes okay okay great uh and in terms of results when can people who upload expect to see ethnicity estimate genetic groups will they see them immediately how long will that take so that takes a bit longer. So we're taking your data. What we're doing uh, when you're uploading your data to us is that we're letting our um, algorithms do most of the work, if not all of it. And we're calculating, calculating your ethnicity estimate, genetic groups, your DNA matches. We have 4.7 million people we need to check if you're matched with. Uh, and that number keeps on growing, usually within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, depends on how busy the servers are. So this week it's uh, it's getting hectic a bit, uh, but it's usually a couple of days, uh, not more than that, and you will receive an email telling you that your results are ready. I will say that if you upload till the 28th, you will still get your, the advanced DNA features for free. So even if your results are not ready by then, so the time that uh, plays bar, plays a role here is when you upload the results, not when they're upload your DNA file, not when your results are ready. So if you upload by the 27th, 28th, even your results already begin March 1st, you would still get uh, all the advanced DNA features. OK, so six more days, everyone. Six more days <laughs> left to, to upload those kits uh, that you may have, uh, friends, family, <laughs> the, the kits that you'd like to manage under your account. Um, OK, we have uh, <laughs> a question here um we had a question about series let's see where that was um sandy says i have had 29 theories for a long time but also notifications that i have new ones yet i still only see 29 theories of family relativity is there a cap or a limit so there's no cap or limit um, so the way we do theory of family relativity, uh, that's, that process is not automatic. We're triggering that every couple of uh, months usually. Uh, and we're just taking all of the data that we were able to gather since then. Think about it. Uh, people are uploading their, we're getting more DNA data and also people are enriching their family trees and we're getting more records. So we are able to find more theories. Uh, there's no cap. I've seen uh, people getting hundreds and hundreds of those. Um, but when we'll do our uh, recalculation, uh, if we find a new theory that didn't exist before, we will add a, a, a new indication next to that uh, so that you can uh, differentiate between the ones that existed before the current run and the ones that which were added now. Uh, and it will appear for 30 days or so. 
uh, from the time we refresh. And there's a nice banner showing you that there are new th uh, theories for you to look at. Uh, so that will go ahead in there. But there's no cap. What we can find, we will show. OK. <laughs> um, Pat asks, can the Chromosome browser matches be downloaded to an Excel program? Yes. So, um, because I need to go over so many things, there's so much more to show. But um, so, for every, uh, there's also an option from the review match page uh, on the Chromosome browser, the one to one, what we call when you're looking at one person. There's an option there to export uh, the, se the segment data. And when you're in the Chromosome browser, the one to many, where you can add up to seven people, uh, you will have the option to export all of the segments to one CSV file. Uh, that contains all of the data that you see on the screen, so that you can use it for um, any purpose that you want. OK. Uh, this is an important question, because we've been talking about uploading a lot. Uh, Bev asks, she says, I have tested with MyHeritage, but also with other companies. Please confirm that there is no benefit to uploading DNA from the other sites. When she's already tested with MyHeritage, she wants to know if there's any benefit if she would upload for 23andMe and Ancestry kits, for example, if she already does have a MyHeritage test for herself as well that she's taken? So there are slight differences. Um, uh, the full answer is really long, but I'll try to keep <laughs> it uh, short. Uh, the different companies are using uh, different um, uh, chips or uh, different methods uh, into what areas of the genome they're looking at. Uh, so every company is uh, choosing the one that suits them the best. Um, and so there might be slight differences. So your ethnicity estimate might slightly change uh, because there's different information from that company that we didn't have and vice versa. And also we might find some very distant relatives or with different amounts of shared DNA uh, because of, I'm sorry, I have to throw these words in the, into the air, but phasing and imputation and some of the things that we're doing internally to detect your DNA matches. So the raw DNA data file that you have from company B uh, will be will be slightly different than the one uh, we have on MyHeritage, and that can cause some differences. Yeah. Hope that answered. <laughs> and I guess at this point in time, there's nothing to lose, Bev. If it's uh, completely free and you get all those advanced features for free, always worth trying for this week. <laughs> Um, Nancy asks, when will you offer this webinar again? <laughs> well, Nancy, I, I did hear Ron mention a few times that he'll have to come back to talk about a few other subjects. So I guess I guess we'll we'll get him in here soon <laughs> soon again. <laughs> um, let's see what else uh, with other questions. Uh, John asks, can I filter or suppress specific faulty sources or trees from theory of family relativity paths? So um, I'll try to, to put it in other words. So I believe John uh, received theory of family relativity, and he found some of them to be inaccurate. Or when he looked at the theory, he um, some of the information there didn't make sense or was wrong. Again, I know many of you are shocked. People don't put accurate information in their family trees. Um, so currently, there's no option to confirm or reject a theory, but that's something we're planning on adding uh, in the future. So you'll be able to mark whether the theory is correct or incorrect, and you'll have an indication. You can change that later on. And uh, that will help you sort out the different theories that you have and already see which ones are confirmed and which one you rejected for whatever reason. OK. Um, Bernice. Hi, Bernice. Hello out there. And um, we have a question from her. She asked, um, I notice that you do not capture the X chromosome. Why isn't it included in the browser? Mm -hmm. So um, again, for another session that we need to schedule, but um, uh, we all have uh, 23 pairs of, cr of chromosomes. Uh, 22 of them are autosomal. And then the additional one is a sex chromosome, which is an X and a Y for males and uh, two Xs for a female. And on my heritage, uh, because of the raw data that we're getting and we're using, uh, we are not doing matching on chromosome X. Uh, the information that we currently have based on the chips that we're using and other things, um, the quality, our ability to run, um, to do uh, quality DNA matching on chromosome X uh, is, uh, is not that great. And therefore, we're doing matching only on the autosomal chromosome, one, 1 to 22. 
Okay, um, I see Angelina asked, can you turn a black and white photo into color on your site? I've seen it somewhere. <laughs> so that's actually, this might be the only Facebook Live that we haven't discussed these <laughs> amazing photo features that we have. So just a word about that, even though it's not really connected to advanced DNA features. Uh, but we'd love for you all to check out our photo features on MyHeritage. We have some fantastic features, uh, one that colorizes black and white photos. Uh, the same tool actually restores old colored photos if they're faded. And we also have the photo enhancer, which enhances photos and brings them back into focus. So uh, definitely check those out uh, on myheritage.com, uh, Angelina. So we'll just take a one last question, Ron, before we give our uh, winner the DNA kit, uh, the, the winning um, comment from today. So before we get to that, I saw a bunch of comments, um, especially from our YouTube viewers. Uh, they were asking, when can they expect the update <laughs> to the ethnicity estimate? So if you could just give a word or two about the change that we did with the genetic groups and then what the difference is between that and the update to our ethnicity estimate that we hope to have coming soon. Sure. So that's another opportunity for me actually to go to invite you all to go to previous uh, Facebook lives that we did and look for the one by uh, Shachar Tenenbaum in which he introduces the genetic groups uh, mid-January, something like that. All right. Um, and uh, on my heritage, really, really briefly, I'll explain. So up till December of, um, to, up till two months ago, uh, when we received your DNA data file, the DNA results, we were able to tell, you, to tell you your ethnicity breakdown from a pool of 42 different ethnicities. And then in December, we released um, something we worked on for many, 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 many months and even years, which we call genetic groups. Uh, which gives a much higher resolution, more accurate results uh, into where in the world uh, your ancestors are from. Uh, and there we have 2,114 different regions uh, that can pinpoint to specific cities or location or uh, towns sometimes. Uh, these are the genetic groups and that was released recently. And uh, now that we're done with the genetic groups, we moved on to work on the ethnicity estimate. Uh, we're working on that together uh, with our science team coming up with uh, a new model based on totally new technology. Uh, and that's in the works. Uh, I don't have a date to share yet, I'm sorry. But I can do, I do, I can tell you that we're, um, some of the results look really promising, but, but that's what I say about that. <laughs> well, we're really looking forward to even more changes and updates. Uh, that are coming our way. So very exciting things to come in 2021 for my Heritage DNA, of course. Um, so we'll give away the My Heritage DNA kit to one lucky winner, uh, and that's going to go to Angela Groundhout. And Angela wrote to us, "I uploaded my DNA to My Heritage, and what I love many features actually." <laughs> to play with is the ability to search specific ethnicities. I find it amazing that there are matches from different places in the world with my DNA. My ancestry goes back in the US to Jamestown in early 1700s. To find matches outside of the US is fascinating. So congratulations, Angela, and we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. Uh, and of course, I just want to say uh, finding matches outside the US, that's something that definitely my heritage is known for, our uh, global, global appeal, right, Ron? Yep, yep, absolutely. I think that's one of the, the great things. I always say that, but uh, we're hearing so many success stories of people finding family. Uh, and there are many in the US, but seeing people meeting family members, new family members who live abroad, uh, from the countries where their ancestors migrated from to other countries. Uh, these are the stories I love the best. And I think um, because my heritage is translated to 42 different languages and people can do genealogy in their own native tongue, um, that's just making it much easier for people to also join the DNA journey on my heritage from other places around the world. And those matches from all around the world is just super cool. 
So share, please share with us if any any of you have other stories uh, of matches that you found from relatives around the world. We'd love to hear them. And thank you all for joining us. Again, if you've missed any part of today's show, I see more people asking. You can you can watch it on the My Heritage Facebook page under the video section. It will be there as well as all of our past Facebook lives. Uh, we have many many more and many more to come. We're doing around two sessions a week, uh, so we'd love to see you all join us at our next one. Ron, thank you again for joining us today. What a fabulous session. Thank you, Esther. It was great. And thank you all for joining. Keep safe. And I uh, hope the next time we'll do it, um, the world will be a little bit more normal. <laughs> so we hope to see you all again soon. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.